how many pounds is in is one stone? I don't even know how how to even I don't know anything about stone. I just know that and it's uh seems very unique to the British and I, I love it. Hello, welcome back. It's been a while. I'm always interested and have a fun time learning about different cultures and how they could sometimes be very similar and exactly the same across the world or just so different, so weird, and honestly so fun. So in this video, I'm reacting to top 10 things in British culture impossible to explain to non-Brits. So myself, of course, and I will give you my take on it. So let me just start it. Let's jump into it and have a fun time. Sit back and enjoy. Number 10, Marmite. A dark brown savory spread invented in the late 19th century and made from yeast extract sludge left over from brewing beer. Sounds yummy. Well, actually, it doesn't. But Marmite fans know the very real joy it can bring when spread thinly on hot buttered toast with a fresh brewed cup of tea to balance out the salty flavor. I don't know if I've ever had Marmite. How popular is this in the UK? Is this something like here in the US we have peanut butter. Everyone has peanut butter or Nutella. Is Marmite a very popular thing there? Everyone typically has it. And I did hear a trick because I don't know if I've ever had it before. But the trick, like they said, do a very, very thin layer um, of Marmite and don't lather it on there like Americans do with peanut butter or Nutella, basically anything. It doesn't take long before new recruit Callum Howe finds another jar in a shocking state. Oh no. Um, it's now. It's baby one. Okay, don't panic. It's not been used in months. Not all Brits feel the same though, and Marmite is famously marketed as a polarizing food that you either love or hate. True the proper or stuff not. is only manufactured in the UK in the Burton on Trent Marmite factory. It's been there since 1902 and produces roughly 50 million jars in a year. And wow. no, Australia, Vegemite is not as good. Number 9. Public schools are private schools. <laughs> You'll often hear it said that our country is run by public school boys. However, this doesn't mean what it might in other parts of the world. It doesn't imply that these politicians went to state-funded institutions and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. It suggests that they were born into extreme privilege and attended some of the most prestigious fee-paying schools in the world. In the UK, we refer to schools for the general public as state schools and private schools for the wealthy as public schools or independent schools. Except not all private schools are called public schools. Some do actually call themselves private schools. And Yeah, that is uh, a, a little confusing there because here in the US we just have public schools and private schools. I know there's private schools around. I, like the mass majority of Americans, went to public school. But I do know the private school around here, to me, in my opinion, is very expensive. It's anywhere from ten to 15000 per child per year. So I think, man, just imagine having three kids all the way until they're 18. I mean, that is, that is a crazy amount of money, at least to me. Maybe not to everyone, but to me. And most call themselves charities, too. Registered charities. Confused yet? No more than you should be. Yes. Number eight. Insults are our love language. Terms of affection and endearment are different the world over. In the UK, you know that someone feels comfortable around you if they insult you to your face. Or they might just be rude. They're not jokes as such. They're just little things to say. Yeah, it's probably fine in the hands of taxi drivers or Cockneys or even Geordies. When you've lived here long enough, you'll learn to tell the difference. Sarcasm may be the lowest form of wit, but it's also a great tool for masking social awkwardness. It stops conversations becoming too serious and fends off the Brit's greatest fear, earnestness. We spend so much time being generally polite, no one wants to put that wall up around their own friends and family. You know what you are? You're a big bag of shit! It doesn't mean we love each other any less, but where's the fun in life without some friendly teasing? Deadpan delivery required, of course. Number seven. Wow, this next one. But uh, what do you think of that one? Because I love, I love sarcasm, 
And I do feel like at least in, in my friend group and the people that I know, uh, yeah, if you could be very straight with someone or just bash someone, one of your friends, it's all in good fun. But let's go on to the next one. Town names and their pronunciation. Let's let's see, it's starting off well. Evan, town names and their pronunciation. British place names are famously difficult for tourists to get their head around. Even native born Brits will get tripped up at some point. The English language has a checkered history. You can blame most of the confusion on the Romans, Anglo-Saxons, oh, yeah. and the Vikings. Also the French and the Celts. I think this is completely true. I mean, there's there's multiple videos. I think I've done a video on it before. Of difficult names to say, difficult cities and towns, roads. And I have heard, let me know if this is true, that this is especially bad. The worst in Wales. But it makes for uh, some good fun. Being able to pronounce the name of Welsh village There we go. has even become something of a party piece. Up the road from the temperature got to 21 Celsius. When you take pronunciation out of the equation, however, there are still a lot of place names that sound like somebody might be having you on. From Fatty Head to Scratchy Bottom, there are oddly named towns in every corner of the British Isles. Number six, the variety of accents. When it gets loudly, it gets very loud indeed. It gets very specific. It's not quite nasal enough the way you're doing it, all right? You're not doing it the way he speaks. Every country has its own differences in dialect and accent, even if it's difficult for an outsider to hear the nuance. But for such a small place, the UK does seem to have a disproportionate amount of variety. I completely agree with that. I feel like you would too. If you live in the UK, you would say, yeah, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of accents um, for a country that is not this massive country. I mean, still even here in the US, I feel like we have our fair share of accents, but it's nothing near as much as the British. It's just, it's a, uh, it's a uh, fun. I think it's a lot of fun to have so many different you just go from like one city to another and I feel like there's differences in the accent let me know if that's that's not true or very true and I do remember one time as a kid we were on a tour in Scotland at some castle and we just at least me you know I was probably 12 or so at the time just could not for the life of me understand our tour guide taking us all throughout this castle just could not understand him and my whole family remembers that to this day but other than that uh, we had no problems but you could definitely tell the difference it's impressive for a long time a british accent was generally thought of as standard received pronunciation but yes with the world opening up regional accents are gradually becoming more familiar to foreign ears what i'm saying is they're like they had themselves proper jobs you know for a gantil then the one deep, you know, learn from broken homes. Oh, sorry, Mark, that was just a noise. A Glasgow accent is very different from a Newcastle accent, which is different from a Birmingham accent. You're a good man. And a good soldier. People in the countryside don't sound the same as those in the town. Some people in Wales and Scotland even speak a whole different language. And nobody speaks like Dick Van Dyke. Bless him. All right, I'll do it myself. Number five, <laughs> hot yeah, and cold I've taps. heard that. There are a few questions that non-natives tend to have about British bathrooms. The no-plugs thing is clearly a health and safety issue. The carpets are about keeping warm, but separate taps for hot and cold, they're a bit more difficult to justify. We do have our reasons, they're just not really relevant anymore. Historically, cold water came from the mains and was safe to drink. I'm quite all right, Barbara. I ran it under a cold tap. Hot water was a later addition to UK households. When it did arrive, it was usually heated in a tank in the loft. Therefore, it wasn't as fresh. Modern bathrooms do sometimes have mixer taps. They've just not really caught on yet. Number four. That is a difference here. I think we, we do have double taps. I guess they call them here. We do have hot and cold, especially in some of the bathrooms. Um, it's not that uncommon, but a lot of them are just one. It is a uh, pretty big difference. The tea obsession. No, Britain is not the only country to enjoy a nice cup of tea. Do you know, I can't remember the last time I had a good cup of tea. But we are quite singular in the way we take it. It's possibly only the Irish who also understand this one. 
For the real tea drinker, you must understand this is not just a casual beverage. It is usually an addiction, begun in late childhood. A cup of tea can be a consolation, an offer of friendship, or a gauge of how long a visitor is going to stay. When a British person says tea, they do not mean chamomile or green or iced, they mean English breakfast, usually with milk and often with sugar. And please, don't leave the tea bag in the cup. Tea Earl Grey hot. Number 3. Metric or Imperial The UK officially adopted the metric system in 1965. Going on to this next one will be interesting since we used definitely, uh, definitely Imperial here. Although we did learn the metric system in school, it wasn't that in depth, but it definitely makes more sense, you know, than, than uh, Imperial. I do know that, say, scientists, for example, have a big issue, or basically anyone working with eh, almost anyone outside of the US when measurements are concerned, any architects or scientists and so on will run into issues. I know there's one, I think it was for the International Space Station or NASA. We we're working together with someone in Europe or multiple European partners. And that one difference caused one mistake in this whole massive process, like multi-billion dollar thing and caused this huge issue. So I don't know, random story, but I do remember that from, uh, from the difference. So let's move on to this. That's over 50 years ago. It's what they use in Europe. It's what we learn in school. It's a much simpler way of working things out as you're working with units of 10, yeah. 12. So why do we still weigh ourselves in pounds and stone? Measure our height in feet and inches? Travel in miles? Buy beer and milk in pints? How many pounds is in is one stone? I don't even know how how to even, I don't know anything about stone. I just know that and it uh, seems very unique to the British and I, I love it. The older generation will occasionally still tell you the temperature in Fahrenheit. Shouldn't we have acclimatized by now? No one under the age of 70 grew up under the imperial system. Good luck explaining this to anyone outside Britain because it makes no sense at all. Number two. I think kind of the same thing here. We kind of got, we're just sticking with imperial. I feel like it takes so long to, people don't like change here. We just kind of stick to the same thing. But it is nice when I'm talking about something in Fahrenheit, I can just straight up say it and everyone will probably understand it. Like today, we're just entering spring and I think it's like in the high 60s, low 70s for the next week. And it's great that you guys could understand. I don't have to think, okay, Celsius, let's see here. Because even if you're like five degrees off in Celsius is just a gigantic like, way way off so uh, it's kind of funny baked beans for breakfast british food has never had a great reputation with the rest of the world we traditionally mm. choose hearty comforting food and that's okay we need it in our climate however if there's one british dish that visitors really can't fathom it's the humble beans on toast baked beans are a staple for the average brit Usually eaten as part of a fried breakfast or as a quick snacky tea, sometimes they're just what you need. They are eaten elsewhere in the world, but you'd be more likely to find them at a barbecue than on a breakfast table. No one else has taken this simple convenience food to their hearts quite like us. HP sauce? So do you do you make the beans with that? Or I have not tried it yet. I did want to try it, but then I heard it's been so long now. I heard you have to do use a certain type of you know, beans, I can't just like find beans in my cabinet, pour beans on the toast and, and go out and eat it and love it. There's like a certain kind of bean and I don't know what this sauce is. So let me know. I, I do want to try it. Number one, what is the country actually called? The United Kingdom, Great Britain, the British Isles. So which is it? Well, the British Isles is a geographical term. It describes a group of islands including Great Britain, the Island of Ireland, the Isle of Man, the Scottish Isles and the Seely Isles. Great Britain is the biggest island in the group and is made up of England, Scotland and Wales. The United Kingdom is a political union, full name the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It includes England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The red, white and blue flag is the Union flag or Union Jack and is composed of flags from England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but not Wales. Got it? And that concludes the video. Yeah, that is something that this whole UK, Great Britain, and so on is very uh, confusing to, to Americans. We don't really know the difference. Actually, probably my first video I did 
was the differences between all of these things and it goes much more in depth than just that but that is something where i bet you hear it all the time especially from americans of us messing it up this was a good video this was fun and entertaining i'm happy to be back uh let me know anything else to this video add on to it any other culture things or even american things like very american culture things that are just very odd to you guys to anywhere outside of the u.s and we'll discuss any of this so thank you for watching i uh, hope to see you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day